Well, looking at this again, quiz tomorrow. Do you have any questions over like what you see content wise? You're pretty well versed in everything that I've covered. If you've been absent, you know that I do post the lectures and you can maybe backtrack or just watch one again for fun. Maybe you'll send one of those uh, you know, lecture videos viral and I'll end up making millions of dollars from YouTube. Anyway, a little bit of new content today. So we're still going to hover in New England for a second. You guys, in your mind, you're like, New England, New England, are you struggling to locate New England? It's a big old blob of Massachusetts. So go northeast of New York and just think it's mostly Massachusetts super Puritans. Even Connecticut, Massachusetts super Puritans with one oddball colony in New England. Rhode Island. Rhode Island, are, they're, they're kind of the different ones. And sorry, New Hampshire, I don't really mention you. Just not too notable with uh, what, what I need to teach. But as for Puritans and natives, I think the writing's on the wall. You can figure out how Puritans are going to treat Native Americans. Just think about how they treat themselves. If you've got a fellow Puritan who's slightly different, what do they do to you? Possibly, yes. If you are a woman who's, you know, like a different woman, a single woman, you don't have kids, yes, they could kill you. Uh, that will happen with, you know, Massachusetts women in the 1690s. So if you think about that, how they'll persecute fellow Protestants like the Quakers by torturing them, boring a hole through their tongue, stoning some to death, how might they view the natives? Not even human. They do not like natives, savage, you know, less than human. And they say when killing natives that they're sending them straight to hell. It's like, oh my, Puritans, you're pretty extreme. And they're going to go on the offensive by kicking out the natives from kind of their you know, Western territory. Why are the Puritans going to go on the offensive? Because they want that land. And I, I think the way to explain it is, think how many Puritans were coming over. You guys remember what I said about that great migration? Oh, like 10,000 come and then another 10,000 and they keep coming and coming and coming and coming. Well, they want that native land. So they go to war to remove the natives, again, encroaching westward, and they are going to treat them terribly. And probably the most terrible part of this war, like the final chapter of this war of removing natives from their land, it's pictured here. And it's one of the worst massacres in American history, where they basically burn down an Indian village and kill all people trying to escape, like men, women, children. It's so brutal. Uh, it will be depicted on the closing questions with some reading, but let's just kind of note that it's called the Massacre at Mystic. This is a bad one. Maybe it's the worst, but sadly, I'll have some other ones to teach you as we go through the year. So Massacre at Mystic, bad massacre. Puritans versus natives. Puritans are taking the land. The Puritans are winning the war. Puritans are kicking out the natives. What do they do with the leftover natives? This is kind of weird. Because if there are some survivors, they're like, oh, well, now we're going to Christianize you. And the way that I can explain this, it's kind of like what the Spanish did with the encomienda system. If this makes sense, you're in great shape. But remember how the Spanish kind of continued to mistreat? They just changed the name. I like encomienda is still slavery. This is still mistreatment. Praying towns, oh yeah, we're going to Christianize you, but they don't care, they don't try. Their aim was to push them out, and that's what happened. If you need a working definition of praying town, something like a, a weak effort of conversion, a feeble effort. The Puritans don't really care to convert the natives. Their aim was to get their land and push them out, and that was accomplished. But you guys remember the trend. Give it 30 years, what's going to happen? Natives are going to regroup, and this time they're going to fight back. So again, they're going to lose battle after battle, war after war. And every one of those losses, the survivors or whoever's left, they're going to go back into the frontier. And in the frontier, there might be some tribal alliances here where they then get a strong group. And this time, the natives go on the offensive. This King Philip's War. Again, you've got the roughly 30-year period here. But now natives have regrouped. They're somewhat powerful. They start attacking Puritan villages. i got a 
mess with you one second. It's called King Philip's War. This is also King Philip. Medicom, a.k.a. King Philip. It's the same guy. The English called him King Philip. His Native American name is Medicom. So King Philip's War, a.k.a. Medicom's War, Natives are now going on the offensive. They are attacking and burning down Puritan villages. What do you think? Are the natives going to win this one? Are they going to hold their land? Are they going to live happily ever after as neighbors of the Puritans? Goes on for a while. I mean, you're looking at a year and a half of fierce warfare, but eventually Medicom is caught. He's drawn and quartered. Like, arms are pulled off, legs are pulled off, his head is chopped off, and his body parts are placed on spikes and left out for a year as warning to the other tribes not to encroach. We're talking like serious, nasty stuff here between Puritans and natives. So yes, natives lose again, pushed further back, give it 30 years, there will be regrouping, there will be another battle. They lose and lose and lose all the way up to the end of this, which will be 1890. So I gotta tell that story a lot as we go forward, but just a brief chapter of Indian trouble in New England any questions you want to ask, anything you need to know about that terrible massacre, the weak effort at conversion, making some sense? You have a map of it, you don't really need to see much other than that's like Massachusetts. The battles take place in New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, whatever, you're fine on that. Looking at this, it's tied to the Native American kind of conflict where the New England colonies kind of get together. And that might just sound like nothing in passing, but this is actually a really big deal. That colonies, separate colonies, get this, separate colonies see themselves as one. This is going to be a big deal, you'll soon see. But it's like, oh, hey, you have Indian problems, we have Indian problems. Let's all get together and form this intercolonial military alliance. Of course, look who they leave out. Or Rhode Island, never in the club, because again, Rhode Island, they're the sewer, Rhode Island, the you know problem colony. But this is notable. This is notable in the fact that separate colonies are getting together. Look how notable it is. I put like big bold words, pretty darn important with this New England Confederation on the grand scheme of things. It is the first act of colonial unity in that long chapter of how our 13 separate became one country. Tell yourself this as you're writing notes as well. This could be a short answer question. A major grade in a month, we have a short answer exam, right? One of the short answer questions, and I come up with 20 of them, but one of them is how we eventually all get together as one united country. So I want steps in colonial unity, like Part A of the question, you're going to describe this. Uh, due to Indian troubles on the frontier, New England colonies decide to get together in a military alliance, seeing that their you know, problems are together, that they're stronger as one rather than separate. And then the next kind of chapter in colonial unity will be a big one. Then there's another chapter in colonial unity until we you know, are one country in 1776. That makes sense? Okay. What's Britain think about this? Do the English care that our colonies are like getting together? Or are they like, ooh, the colonies are getting together, I'm scared. I know that you don't have a full understanding of English history at this time. Some might recognize that term. The English don't care. The English, the way that I would explain this is they've got so much on their plate, they can't manage half of what they have. So they're like, oh yeah, the colonies. They put the blinders on and they look the other way. Salutary neglect. It's ignoring the colonies, letting them develop on their own. The colonists love this. The colonists love the independence. They love the self-rule. But again, why is Britain doing this? They've got so many problems. They're about to go into a civil war. They've got problems with France. And their empire is growing where they've got colonies all around the world. They've got problems with the Irish. They've got issues where they just kind of, eh, Ignore the colonies. Societary neglect, letting the colonies develop on their own. Makes sense? Okay. It's briefly going to end. And I got to teach you a whole lot of English history in like three minutes. You don't get this in WAP for whatever reason, 
but I said England was on the eve of a civil war. They went into a 10 year long civil war. So England, they're fighting themselves, fighting themselves. And in the aftermath of the civil war, the new king, don't stress the name, but the new king wants to rule with an iron fist. The new king is going to put the colonies like directly under his thumb and micromanage them. So this new king dissolves the New England Confederation and puts this thing into play. This thing is going to, again, put the colonies under the microscope. The colonies don't have that salutary neglect, don't have that freedom. They will be actively managed. And to make matters worse, he puts this guy in charge of them. This guy is like the dictatorial leader in New England. No more self-rule, New England. He is your dictator. So again, just think, new king, strongman king, put strongman in charge, and to make things even worse and make him more hated, he's Catholic. What does New England think of Catholics? They hate Catholics, yet this guy is their dictator. And this guy starts to pass laws and enforce laws, specifically these. Now I'm going to tap into some prior knowledge that I'm confident you have. You'll, like, this will be screaming in your brain, and you're going to love the fact that you remember this from world history. It's the grand economic system of, like, the 1600s, 1700s. It's where the colonies support the mother country. In fact, the purpose of the colonies is to feed the mother country. Do you now know what I'm talking about? Mercantilism. 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 If you have not heard mercantilism, you will. Don't stress it. But mercantilism, just kind of understand it was never enforced under salutary neglect. Like in the times Britain's ignoring the colonies, think about it. All that colonial tobacco, they traded with whoever they wanted to. Under mercantilism, it must go straight to England. But under salutary neglect, the colonists sold it to the Spanish, sold it to the French, whoever. All that fish they're catching in New England, eh, sell it to the French, sell it to whoever. But now, you cannot. Now this guy enforces the Navigation Acts, which enforce this mercantilist economic system. And to specifically lay out the Navigation Acts, it's like, oh, you're selling tobacco? Well, that tobacco is now boarded on an English ship with an all-England crew, Destination England. You see it? The colonists are freaking out. They hate this thing. They feel oppressed. They hate this guy. They hate the new king. But guess what happens in England? Another revolution. You see how there's a lot of crazy history going on. This new revolution in England, well, the dictatorial leader, his head is chopped off. It's called the Glorious Revolution. Two new people take over, William and Mary. Don't stress the names. I'm not teaching you English history here. But the point is that two new people don't care about the colonies again. And they're like, oh, yeah, whatever. You guys do what you want. And that'll be the trend for the next 70 years. So you see it. you got a pocket of time where salutary neglect ended and the colonists hated that oppression. They hated that, you know, strong arm governance. They love salutary neglect. And when this thing comes back in the 1760s, you are on a direct path to revolution. In the 1760s, the Brits start passing new taxes like a stamp act and a tea act. And then they start putting troops in the homes. They're actively managing once again. And you'll see how that will directly lead to the Revolutionary War. Again, it could have here, but this thing dissolved with the you know, king's head being chopped off and this glorious revolution. Kind of makes sense? You may gloss over a lot of that English history. Uh, I'm not testing you on that, but I just think it's important for context. But if that sounds fascinating to you, they cover it in AP Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, AP Europe, Miss Mercer, next year, maybe you guys could put that on your uh, you know, schedule, agenda. There again, salutary neglect. Do what you want. I don't care. Put the blinders on. Eh, do whatever you want. Salutary neglect, most of all colonial history, with the exception of that brief dominion of New England time. And then what decade does it resume? 1760s. So just think, most of colonial history, brief period, dominion of New England, 
and then the micromanaging resumes in the 1760s. A basic timeline, I think, will help you out. All right, last topic. We got the plantation colonies. And any time you get a new colonial region or old colonial region, which you already have in your brain, you shake out political, economic, social. Political, economic, social. Those are the things to shake out of your brain. And this, politically, you can just generalize because I told you they all have something like this. Representative government. So these plantation colonies, these southern plantation colonies, they all have a form of representative government. I'm not going to overwhelm you and you know, give you the exact name of each colony's representative body, but they all have representative governments. Economically, easy. Cash crops. What might jump out to you is that cotton is not on the list. Cotton is not a money maker yet. You need the cotton gin, which is early 1800s, to make cotton profitable. And by the 19th century, you guys will see the entire South will transform to cotton production. But it's not there yet. It's not a money maker. They're making their money through rice plantation, tobacco plantation, indigo, which is like a dye, makes things like purple, fashionable clothing in England. They love indigo. Uh, this one also shows corn and pigs on the list. But cotton was not profitable yet. So that's our economic detail of the plantation colonies. Socially, I think, note something about slavery and the most slaves are in these plantation colonies. In fact, if we wanted to look at you know, these five of the South, one has a majority slave population. I guess you have a one in five shot if you want to guess which colony has a majority slave population, meaning most of the inhabitants are slaves. Anyone want to venture a guess? Georgia. Not Georgia. Georgia, interestingly enough, tried to establish itself as a anti-slave colony. Not North Carolina. Virginia. Yay, South Carolina. Good guessing, kind of. South Carolina, you guys are going to find it's majority slave, both as a colony and as a state. So South Carolina will have over 50% slaves in it. So heavy dominance on slavery. There is a social ladder. And the way that I would explain that is that the wealthy plantation owners are the most powerful in society. They dominate everything for generations. Like some of these plantation owners, their last names are the Washingtons. Can you think of any influential Washingtons in American history? Yes. Granddaddy Washington owned a massive plantation, and sure enough, the entire family was influential. Another influential family name would be Lee. Lots of influential Lees in the South, like Robert E. Lee, if you remember that guy from the Civil War. The family stays dominant for a long time. So social ladder at the very top plantation owners, slaves on the bottom, indentured servants. And you can just kind of, you know, figure out the other rungs if you need to. I'm not going to stress it. Not a test question. Huh. Are they religious? Yes and no. Yes, they have religion. They're Anglican. But the way that I would explain the, the role of their religion, it is not the driving factor in their mm -hmm. lives. So if you guys are making like comparative or contrasting notes, religion is everything in New England. Just think, religion in New England, blue laws to enforce it. It's a theocratic system in New England. Here, it's like, yeah, they're religious, but I would say money is the driving factor. And think about the origin of like Jamestown and that joint stock company. They're not coming for a religious asylum. They're coming to make money, and that is kind of their principle. Money, money, money in the South. But yes, they are Anglican. Just kind of think money first, religion second. They also destroy the soil, meaning that, yes. So Virginia and Maryland are... I know this is going to... This is going to mess with you guys for a second. Virginia and Maryland are technically part of the South, but they're so unique we pull them out and call them what? So they are the Chesapeake but technically the Chesapeake colonies are part of the South. Now, again, you're okay. I would ask you about the Chesapeake colonies, but they are technically plantation with tobacco, but they have so many unique characteristics, we pull them out in history and just call them the Chesapeake colonies. But yeah, the South starts in Maryland. 
Um, you'll kind of see that as we even go through the Civil War. The South starts like right around here, and then draw a line, that's the South. So like I was saying, they all destroy the soil, meaning they're all moving westward. Guess who they have conflict with, too? They also have conflict with Native Americans. Do we have any like friendly people with Native Americans? Not many. You had the pilgrims, but remember how the pilgrims become the Puritans? Yeah, and you saw how that worked out with a massacre at Mystic. So we had like a moment of happiness with Thanksgiving. Yay, Squanto. But then sure enough, they all come and then they treat them horribly. Maybe Pennsylvania has the best relations with natives, but that too is not everlasting. Wait till you see the massacre that happens there. So it's like, ugh, it's not a friendly Native American history. Georgia does sometimes stand out as an independent question. I'm not going to ask that you write like an epic bio on the founder, but his name does pop up in test questions. Some people are like holding on to his name from prior knowledge. And they're like, oh, hey, that's James Oglethorpe. Maybe you don't remember that, but I'll put a keyword next to his name that I think will help you out in recognizing, say, the correct matching answer tomorrow. He's an idealist. He envisions the best and like, you know, roses and happiness for all. He's an idealist. He wants Georgia to be anti-slavery. He wants Georgia to be like a haven for debtors. That's idealist. It's not realist because Georgia is going to develop a different way. But sometimes his idealism finds its way into test questions where, again, he wants it for debtors. He wants it to be like you no know, slavery. Other Georgia questions, it's the last, and it's a buffer. Now I'm going to test your geography skills. If it's a buffer, what's south of Georgia? Florida. And who owns Florida? Spain. Uh, Florida is a disaster. Florida is full of pirates. Florida is full of chaos. They need a buffer to protect those wealthy plantation colonies like the Carolinas. So that's kind of Georgia's design. It's a buffer colony. South of it is Spanish Florida, last colony. And again, there's his like idealism. Yay, debt relief and anti-slavery. Georgia does not really develop that way. Georgia just turns into those same old other southern plantation colonies. One more slide, people, of new information. And then we're done for the week. You ready? With the Carolinas, yes, slavery. I kind of covered South Carolina. But we have another kind of terrible Native American note with the last of the tribes being conquered here. The last of the coastal tribes, the Yamasee. And I would just kind of chalk that up and think about the other tribes that I've introduced to you. Like you remember Squanto? His tribe was the Wampanoag. They're now conquered or dead. Ooh, remember the Powhatan Confederacy? They're now conquered and dead. The Pequots? conquered dead, and any survivors that are left are forced well into the interior. This is the last of the coastal tribes, and you're in the 1730s when they are conquered. And we call this a conquest because, again, you got ugly kind of genocide-like history here where they are exterminated, essentially. So by the 1730s, all of those coastal tribes, either dead from disease, war, or just pushed to the interior. So the Yamasee, that's kind of why they you know, have a page in the history books. You get the Yamasee, the last of the coastal tribes. Okay, now you have it. Now you've got all these regions. Now you've got the map. And, you know, if you get a map question tomorrow, could you find Georgia? Could you find the buffer, uh, the buffer colony? Could you circle the Chesapeake colonies? Do you know the New England colonies? Or are you going to mess up and try to throw like a random in New England? So I think that's where you need to be. And again, New England, that's here. New York is not in New England. New York is part of what region? The breadbasket, the middle. New York is part of the middle along with Pennsylvania. They are the breadbasket. They are the most diverse. Ooh, what region is the least diverse? Massachusetts. Massachusetts is all pure-blooded Puritan. If you're not a pure-blooded Puritan, don't be in Massachusetts. But these guys, remember, the Dutch, 
um, you know, English are there, the Swedes are there, the Germans are there, the most diverse region in the middle. Which region has the least diverse economy? I have that question out there. Which region that we've learned has the least diversified economy? It's basically a one crop money maker. It's the Chesapeake. It's all tobacco in the Chesapeake. And I know I told you bread basket, but technically the middle colonies still have some diversity. But the least diverse is going to be the Chesapeake. So you guys are going to need to like extract details, political, economic, and social. You might need to find a few on the map. And tell yourself this, down the road on the major grade short answer exam, I ask you to compare and contrast like the Chesapeake and New England. And I'll say part A, compare and contrast social details. Part B, compare and contrast economic details. Part C, compare and contrast political details. I lay out basically that entire short answer exam with these clues that I give in the lecture. It's like, this will be one of the questions, but you guys don't know which one you're going to get because I come up with like 20. I told you another one that is on there today, the colonial unity one. Colonial unity, part A, part B, part C. I need three examples of how we unify from 13 separate to one united. So anyway, I feel like you got some of these details in your brain. And then, of course, closing questions and a, an ounce of review is going to help you guys out today. Um, knock out the closing. Again, talk it out with people. And you'll see at the end, I say, look at the objective statements. Quiz each other with the objective statements. I'll quiz you. I'll walk around. I'll help you out. But you okay with me? Okay, a little bit of weight on your shoulders. You're not, like, collapsing from this weight. But now it's a little bit on you guys. Celebrate that knowledge tomorrow, but let me know if you still need, need to. Let me know if I can help. Do you want your question to go? Yeah. Do you want your question now to leave, or do you want uh, your question when you come back? Oh, no, my question was can I go to I know, but my question for you is what religion is John Winthrop? Can you answer that right? You can go. Uh, I'm not sure. So you want a question when you come back? Okay, I'm going to ask that and another question. So you think about what religion John Winthrop is. You like my fun math and policy here? Be prepared. And I know she knows the religion of John Winthrop. That was just like, a, oh, I'm scared I don't want to answer her question. What is it, people? Yes, he's super Puritan. We know that. I think I'll ask her, uh, John Winthrop. Catholics, not. Don't confuse yourself too much with religion. But John Winthrop is definitely not Catholic. Sir Edmund Andros is Catholic. Yeah. I think, hey, I'll ask her when she comes back John Winthrop's quote. She should be able to get that. Right? Yeah, and then another quote that I would ask you guys that could be on this quiz is John Smith's quote. And I know a lot of Johns, a lot of Williams, a lot of you guys will be okay. No, you're not.